Hey everyone, welcome back to the lab. In this video, we're going to be talking about Instagram, Meta, Facebook's weird tech stack, the most surprising things about their choices in tech. So to start this story, as a software engineer, I'm often looking for best practices, best ways to spin up servers, the most scalable software systems, new techniques for shipping code faster and safer. And to do this, I often consume a lot of different tech content from you know, textbooks to understanding what the community and surveys are saying to going to these conferences to learn like the latest and greatest. And the offer, the value proposition of these is that they're gonna be serving best practices, these ways to build tech better. But I've also had a good amount of firsthand real life experience. For instance, I worked for three years as a software engineer at Meta, building and scaling the video and logging pipelines at Facebook and Instagram. This is one of the largest software systems in the world that serves over a billion users every day. And the problem with that is that often what I actually saw in practice at one of the most scalable systems in the world clashed with what was being told as best practice in a lot of these more academic forms. And so if one of the most scalable systems isn't using the best practices, then it calls into question what these best practices are actually best practices in the real world. And so that's what we're going to be talking about in this video, detailing some of the most surprising things that I found about Meta's tax tech, especially those that contradicted a lot of the best practices I'd seen around the web. And so we're going to visit this in three different categories. First, we're going to talk about architecture, then programming languages, and then finally, version control. And at the end, I'm going to leave with a few takeaways and next steps, which are really around my recommendations for real life best practices. Let's get started. First, we have architecture. So a common claim I see in many different forms around the web is that monoliths don't scale. They're too expensive. They take up too much resources. They're hard to spin up. They're hard to turn into serverless. And often with the cell that this other architecture works better. But we have some pretty good data that monoliths do scale. And that is that Meta runs on monoliths. These big blobs of code that are just deployed and served across hundreds of thousands to millions of servers, depending on the data and reports you look at. A lot of this stuff is serving core app logic, which is really the meat of, or the backbone of these applications. Now for references to all of these stats and numbers and open reports and stuff, I'll have them in my uh, blog post, which is linked below and will be linked in the description. Now on balance, we should really say that monoliths can scale. And if we look closely, we actually see that Meta isn't using strict monoliths. What they're really doing is something I call service-based monoliths, where the core app, the thing that is doing a lot of the business logic and connecting other stuff is a monolith. But then a lot of specialized workloads are actually pulled out into their own services. And if you look at what these specialized workloads are, they're often really heavy compute workloads or things that require specialized hardware that don't really make sense to be in the monolith because they would kind of slow each other down. And so some of these specialized workloads that, that make sense to maybe pull out to an own service and optimize are things like you know, video encoding, ML, data processing, a lot of these things that just are too much to do in real time, but we can actually get a lot of gains by just moving them out separately. Now I have pretty strong feelings about monoliths and believe they're a simple scalable system. And if you wanna learn more about this and some of the real world recommendations I have for using them in your own projects and services, you can check out this video, Software Monoliths for Scale, which I have linked here and in the description. All right, next we have programming languages. So software engineers love to fight about the best programming languages. Which one's fastest? Which one has the best features? Which one works the best in a different or very specific workload? And we have all sorts of benchmarks that help us decide this, um, none of which are you know, especially accurate. Uh, and we also have tons and tons of descriptions for why these results are the way that they are. But a common argument and a common separation is between like faster languages and slower languages. And if you look at a lot of these benchmarks, we often find a few languages that are marked as quote unquote slow. And this might be things like JavaScript, Python, PHP, Ruby, things like this. This is all pulled from a real world benchmark, a web frameworks benchmark, which I've used in a lot of my own videos, linked here and below. And so the claim is that these slow languages don't scale. They're gonna get in the way of you scaling. 
But we have data that shows that's the language do scale. And so if we look at Meta and Facebook, it's running on these monoliths of PHP, just these huge PHP blobs. And the same as if we look at Instagram, it's just running Python and Django, a very popular common entry stack. But of course, to be fair, while these slow languages do scale in Meta's case, it may not scale in other cases. And so we have to say that slow language can scale. And if we actually look at what they're doing, uh, Meta and Facebook does run on PHP, but they actually forked this a long time ago into a now entirely new language called Hack. And they did this and were able to get two to 10 times more performance out of each server, depending on what benchmarks you're looking at. And the same thing with Instagram. They were running on Python and Django, but they've now forked it so much that in some ways it's not recognizable or compatible. And one of the things that they open sourced recently is their C Python fork called Cinder. And again, depending on the benchmark you look at, it's one to 10x faster. So they are running these slower languages, if you will, but they did a lot of work to try and make them work for their use cases. And finally, remember that they're not just running these monoliths, they are running these kind of service-based monoliths with these specialized services isolated out. And for those, we often see that they're choosing much faster languages and technologies, depending on the actual workload. So wouldn't be a surprise to see C++ and Rust and things like that. Finally, we get to version control. And so the claim is that Git is the tool for version control. And if you look around the market, that's not too wrong. I mean, Git's kind of everywhere. It's, we've got all these different repo choices like GitLab, GitHub, Bitbucket, and they all basically use Git uh, by default. And you'll likely see that it integrates with whatever IDE you're using directly, or there's some plugin that allows it to happen. What's interesting is that data shows that Meta doesn't actually use Git. Instead, they use a version control system called Mercurial. And the reason that they did this is that they were running into issues with scaling the version control to their millions of files and tens of thousands of developers who are trying to add to history every single day. Here's an interesting blog post that they released uh, around 2014 that I have linked in, in my blog post uh, below that goes through some of the challenges that they had. And the team has since released several updates of how they continue to build on these systems to make them scale further. Now that said, on balance, you know, Git is the most popular VC tool by a long shot. If we look at Stack Overflow's 2022 dev survey, Git is used by about 94% of developers. And popularity has a lot of perks. Like, like we already talked about, it has its integrations with all of the IDs and tools that you're probably using. It has the tooling, the repository support via all these companies that actually support it, GitHub, GitLab, etc. And then actual support of when you actually run into a problem, it's very likely you'll run into some sort of blog post or documentation of someone else who already ran into that, so you can quickly solve it. And with Mercurial down at 1%, it's very unlikely that you're gonna get that. Now that said, I don't think Git's popularity necessarily means it's very good. And I really think that Facebook's version of Mercurial internally really spoils developers because it really is so easy to use version control. And I really think Git is probably ripe for disruption. So I'm closely looking at this project, a Sapling, which is Facebook's attempt to open source this stuff, because I think, you know, even if this isn't the one that wins, Git could be so much better that it might spur other people to look into this. And that's it. Three interesting things that I found about Meta's tech stack that kind of goes against best practices that everyone talks about. Now I did want to leave you with a few takeaways to actually use best practices that kind of work for the real world. And I think the main one that I want to leave this one with is that you should probably just start with monoliths, uh, specifically these kind of service-based monoliths because it scales really well and it's pretty easy to keep manageable for a long time. If you're interested in how I actually build my projects, including the software architectures and the specific technologies and how I host them and everything like that, you can check out this video on CloudSeed, the F-Sharp Soap Kit boilerplate I use to launch all my projects. And that's it. Uh, as always, let me know if you have any questions about system designs, programming languages, you disagree with everything I say, let me know, and this is where you can send that. So thanks for watching, and I will see you in the next one.